All right, thank you to David. If you're a brother who'd like to ask a question, just raise your hand. Josiah will bring you the microphone. Please stand and be recognized and ask your question as uh, clearly and uh, loudly as possible so David can hear you and he'll do his best to answer. While you're thinking about your question, I'll start by asking you about 1 John 2, since I'm the one who asked you in the first place and I've got the microphone. Okay. <laughs> uh, so in 1 John 2, the apostle ta uh, addresses part of his letter to three different classes of individuals to uh -huh. fathers, young men, and little children, depending on what your translation reads. And basically, I've heard it argued, essentially what you have just taught, but using this as almost a pattern for the premise that you have laid out regarding recognizing those who have spiritual maturity as the people who should be making decisions. So in a home, you have children, and you might listen to your children, but their opinion will probably not sway a decision too much. But when your children reach an age of you know, young adulthood, then you might consider what they have to say a little bit more and making a decision. But ultimately, the father decides. And that that, in a spiritual context, in the context of a congregation, may be what John has in mind here as he addresses these three different groups of people. So what do you think about that idea? Is that a way that we could classify individuals within a congregation and then determine, well, only spiritual fathers should be making decisions, although we would certainly consider what the young men and the children have to say? Jonathan, wasn't he, Jonathan, wasn't he the one that asked the long question long, long ago? You better believe lots it. Lots of questions in there. Lots of questions in there. Well, let me read the passage. I write it to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I write to you fathers because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you young men because you have overcome the wicked one. I write to you little children because you have known the father. I have written to you fathers because you have known him who is from the beginning. I have written to you young men because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the wicked one. Okay, I've tried to lay this out in a little bit of a grid here where we can kind of see what's going on here. And pardon the Greek words, I put them in there for my own benefit. But if you look at all these, uh, I've sort of tried to structure this passage a little bit. And really what you've got here is two groups. He says, I am writing to you in the present tense. And then down here he says, I have written to you. And there's a lot of speculation as to why he does that. But essentially what he does is address in both sections uh, the same two groups, children, fathers, young men, Children, fathers, young men. I understand these to be a reference to not literally uh, children and fathers and young men, but people at different levels of spiritual stature in the gospel of Christ. You know, it may not be physical age, physical age at all. But uh, when you look at that, it's a little confusing to read the passage. That's kind of why I tried to break it out like this so we can kind of see it in an organized way. But... I don't know, I, I kind of knew where the question was coming from. Uh, it, it seems like, though, to read it that way, you're going to have to superimpose an, a grid over it, imported from everything I've already said tonight. And I don't know if that's where John was going with that or not, uh, to be honest with you. Uh, I mean, I believe that he's referring to different levels of, uh, of uh, spiritual growth. Uh, I don't know how we could defer that or be, make that become uh, the father's I don't know I don't know I, I really don't know um, to be honest with you how we how that would work unless we just you know as like I said in, uh, impose that interpretation on it from elsewhere right like maybe the household of Stephanus as you mentioned in first Corinthians 16 yes yeah these would be maybe spiritual fathers at Corinth kind yes. of an idea yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, only short questions apparently tonight. So Sean Willis, and then we'll come over here to Matt Kuderna and Austin Maddox. Thanks. Enjoyed that. Um, my question is, is tied to, you're talking about uh, leadership in the absence of eldership. And oftentimes, if, if I'm understanding, we're looking at it at a place where they don't have it, but they need to be pursuing it. Is there any different or change or, or how do we handle in principle does some, the same principles apply when eldership exists, but unfortunately, because of the necessity of plurality, it disappears, but one is still present. It is, that has been recognized for years, has been looked to as an elder, but due to an unfortunate circumstance or the passing of another elder, 
Now the eldership has dissolved. And so you're in the absence of eldership with someone who was an elder. What, what principles would you use to guide that particular situation? Well, you mentioned that. Actually, we have that in the very congregation where I worship. Uh, we had three elders five years ago, and then we had two, and now we have one, which means we don't have one. But uh, what we do there is basically what we've done before, is that brother, we, you know, his, his advice, his input, his, you know, his, his, his advice on whatever still is certainly weighed heavily. It's just that he's not officially considered an elder as such. Um, would be my answer to that question. Matt Fudera, awesome. I'm going to piggyback a little bit off of Sean's question. If, you know, in, in the scenario that we have men who are qualified and we, and these principles of having men who are good Bible students and are wise, they are leading the church but are not elders, but they are qualified, but one, both, all three of them, however many there are, are not willing in their current state to take the office. What can we do as members of a congregation to encourage these men to seek out that office and to take it? I think that's a huge question. Uh, I could, and I'm not sliding your question, but I can take that around and say, how can we get the fellow who has the skill to be a teacher and won't do it? How do we get him to do that? If I knew the answer to that question, I could solve a million problems and answer a thousand questions. Uh, you know, it, it definitely has to come from, you know, from, from the heart. They have to desire to do it. And, you know, I, I, all I can do is admonish them and encourage them in that direction, uh, I don't know if I'm very uh, offering a very satisfactory answer. I wish I had one to that question, frankly. Thank you, David. That was fantastic presentation, and um, I really, really appreciate it. My question, I'll admit right from the beginning, is probably it's an impossible question, but okay. um, All right. I, <laughs> I'm hoping that maybe you'll have. Uh, just some pointers. I, I don't know if there's a right answer, I should say. Um, so as you've laid out here tonight, it's, I think you presented it's less than ideal, the fully democratic approach where every, bro every brother from the, the, the latest dunked to the, to the longest Former dunked, elder. Yeah, yeah. Uh, gets an equal vote. Um, let's say there's someone who's in this audience or someone watching this video later and they're in a congregation and they say, you know, you know, that's right. We need to have men who, who are diligent students of the Word of God. And maybe there's some people we need to exclude from that decision-making process. Um, in that, I think we're familiar with the transition from no elders to elders, even though that in and of itself is hard. But what about a transition from a fully democratic system to one that may be less democratic? I'm not sure I caught the the, 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 the thrust of that. Oh, oh, that's the main question. Yeah, uh, that's another great question. That's kind of one I'd put in his category. Uh, you're right; it's an impossible question. Uh, seeing that situation, you know, it really kind of comes back to a question I've had a lot of conversation. Mike and I have talked a lot about who is a teacher. You know, just because you give a lesson a couple of times a, a year doesn't make you a teacher. I mean, who is in that company of teachers that are actual teachers? I mean, we have a lot of fellows who can, can fill a slot, and I'm not trying to be critical, but their, their biblical knowledge is, is, is weak or maybe not what it could be or ought to be. Do you consider them a teacher? And if not, and they never progress, do you keep them a teacher? I mean, I think this is sort of addressing the same kind of thing you're asking. Uh, and I don't know. I think it just kind of depends on the individual basis, the, the personalities involved, you know, the particular person or whatever. Uh, I don't know. That's about the best I can do with that 
you know, unless I had a specific example where I was dealing with it directly, personally. Time to name names. Alan Bonifay. <laughs> <laughs> Good job, David. Uh, first of all, historically, among our own people, people have often talked about this topic, leadership when you don't have elders, like there's nothing in the Bible about church leadership if you don't have elders. And that is just not true. In uh, uh, Acts 13, uh, Someone asked me one time, I was presenting on this same issue, if there's, if, is there any passage of scripture that shows teachers involved in leadership? I talked about Acts 13 for 30 minutes, and I said, well, how many do you need? Acts 13 is one. We, God never intended for his churches to have no leadership. That's crazy. Yeah. Uh, and determining who's a teacher Who's a respected, mature teacher in a congregation is difficult. That's what these two questions have been about. And there's no real easy answer to that. You've got to teach the congregation. You may have to talk to these individuals. But I think this passage you mentioned up there, Hebrews chapter 5, is important in this. A teacher is one who does not have to have the first principles explained to him over and over and over. He's got that down. He's a person who's able to study difficult questions from the Bible. He doesn't have to be fed on milk all the time. He's a person who is skilled in the word of righteousness, not unskilled, and by reason of use, which means experience, he is able to discern between good and evil. If we teach the congregation these things, not just once, but over and over again, we can begin to make progress in this area. And the fact is, the Bible does teach. You know, uh, first, I'm talking off the top here. First Corinthians 12 says he gave into the church first apostles, then prophets, then teachers, I believe. Evangelists, pastors, and teachers. No, that's okay. Ephesians 4. This is 1 Corinthians 12. Third is oh, teachers. Oh. Yes. And, yeah, okay. Yeah. And that's describing uh, a leadership function in the church. Yeah. Anyway, good job. Oh, and by the way, on that, that's a, Paul's asking a rhetorical question. Are all teachers? Several, several, three or four rhetorical questions, and the answer implied is no. Right. On that matter about uh, churches not having elders or not kind of not, like they're not legitimate congregations, a lot of people may have this book by H.E. Phillips. I think you and I were talking about this. H.E. Phillips' book, Scriptural and Elders and Deacons. A lot of good information in there. It's kind of tedious to read, but it's a little disappointing because that's basically the impression he leaves you with is that if you don't, that there's no alternative. You either have elders or you're not a church, basically. I mean, I'm sort of putting it in blunt terms, but but that. You know, that's one of the disappointments of that book, if you, if you ever read it. Greg Gay? Sometimes we forget that gospel preachers can do more than just get in the pulpit and preach. And so when Titus was left at Creek to set things in order, we usually immediately say, well, he just ordained elders. But in working with the congregation and getting to know them over time, you may result have a result of elders but what you're looking for is faithful men who are the faithful men and preachers can be used to help with that now we we call a preacher in to preach for well it's just about a one-day meeting you know anymore <laughs> or or a, or a two-week meeting no a five-day meeting we can also call preachers in to say can you help our teachers and some of us in this audience, including you, are involved in that work online and in person around the country and around the world. So no congregation has to say, we're just stuck. There's help. We wouldn't put kindergartners in a room and say, figure out how to read. We would give them some help. And so some of our congregations will be led by people who are kindergartners in the truth, 
but they're willing to learn. So when faithful men are to teach faithful men, we need to use the resources that we have among us. That's what we're here for all over the brotherhood. And some of us have skills in certain areas that others do not have. And that can be helpful to us all. So I would encourage a congregation to recognize every congregation has leadership. As a boy chasing cows on a farm, the cows are always led to the barn. Somebody's going to lead. May not be the best cow, but somebody's going to lead. So wherever we go home to worship, somebody is leading. And if that's not appropriate, who has the courage to say our leadership is not appropriate because it's not taking us where we want to go? So if a congregation's leadership only discusses the lawn or who to have for the next meeting or various other things that are important but not essential, then we never get to those issues of what are our goals as a congregation and how are we going to get there and what is our part as an individual and a family in the work of this congregation. Our work is more than just assembling for worship. And until we see that, we're not going to be set in order, let alone grow as faithful men. Okay, that's enough. Amen. Long Not Tyson. There was no question. There was no question, so I had inspired. It was the question. So yours is still the longest question. I won't try to change that. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned that book. I just started it Saturday. I'm only a, maybe a couple dozen pages in, and he's shared the idea that the business meeting system of leadership, I get the, the feeling from what I've read, he doesn't look favorably on that. Uh, do you have any ideas on alternatives uh, when it comes to church leadership without elders of a way to lead without that traditional business meeting uh, system that you know many are probably accustomed to? Well, I've always, my philosophy has always been the fewest business meetings the, the, the best. The fewest business meetings possible uh, just to avoid trouble if trouble is going to happen. Uh, you know, again, it's, it's a matter of, you know, the people involved. Sometimes it's easier in some situations it would be to, to you know, make decisions on a more informal basis than it would be with another group, you know. It depends on the people, I guess, a lot of times. If you don't have, if you don't have that disagreeable person like I was talking about earlier, then a lot of times you could, you know, it's a lot easier to do it, you know, to avoid it conflict and to avoid trying to to uh, make decisions you know in that matter i don't know if i'm answering your question or not it's kind of it's i don't know i, I, I seem like i'm taking them all the same but it just seems to be the way it is out of the, the goodness of my heart i'm going to let jonathan edwards sneak a last minute 30 second question <laughs> it's a comment more than a question to that end I think a word that we should use a lot in this discussion is the word consensus. And we went from a business meeting model to eldership, and the men who became elders were the consensus builders. They weren't interested in voting yeah. or like creating quorum. They wanted to make sure that the leadership team was all on board with whatever decisions needed to be made. And that's how we learned to trust them as shepherds, was that they built consensus with this. So I like that word. Any final comments? Yeah, that's good. Any final oh, comments? Um, just, again, thanks for the opportunity to participate. I always appreciate it. I'm very humbled that uh, you consider me to, to participate in this study, and I enjoy preparation, and I enjoy the time here, and I enjoy being with everyone. And so I thank you very much.